So hello everyone, it's my pleasure to join this group for this fantastic course. So I'd like to, first of all, to thank the organizers and go straight ahead in the, into the discussion that will be about arboviral infections in the context of global health. My name is Aloysio Segurado. I am professor of infectious diseases at the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. This is the outline of my presentation. We'll start talking about agroviruses, a brief overview and historical context in Latin America. Then we'll go into the clinical aspects of these viral infections, their disease burden and geographic distribution. And finally, we'll discuss control and prevention measures and the public health challenges we are currently facing. So let's start by saying that arboviruses are part of a large number of infectious agents, according to the international catalog of arbovirus and other viruses of vertebrates. There are over 500 arboviruses in the Brazilian Amazon. We can find one third of these. The name arbovirus comes from the word arthropod born virus. And from that, we already understand that these viral infections are transmitted with uh, vectors. There are, as you see, there is a large number of different arboviruses that can cause human infection. It, uh, we wouldn't have time to discuss all of them. So I have decided to concentrate in the arboviral infections that are currently being transmitted in Brazil, where I live. So this is the first table in which we show one of the arboviral families, Flaviviridae. This, this family comprises over 60 different viruses with different animal reservoirs, different vectors, and that may lead to different clinical outcomes. So let's have a quick look on those. And the ones you see in bold type are the ones that are currently be, being transmitted in Brazil. So as you see in the column in the right, you see that the clinical manifestations of these arboviral infections are various. And they can include encephalitis for a number of agents, fever, rash, and arthropathy for others, and hemorrhagic fevers and hepatitis, particularly for yellow fever. So we, if we take only those that are circulating in Brazil, we'll have the encephalitis group, which includes the West Nile and St. Louis encephalitis, which have birds as animal reservoirs and Culex mosquitoes as vectors. We'll have Rocio, encephalitis that was originally described in Brazil, which also has birds and, as animal reservoirs, but a different vector. And finally, we'll come to the other uh, diseases that show up as fever, rash, and arthropathy. These are the most common arboviral infections we have been talking about in the past few years, and they include dengue, Zika and Mayaro. They are all transmitted by Aedes aegypti mosquitoes or Aedes albopictus mosquitoes, but can also be transmitted by other sylvatic mosquitoes like Hemagogos. In contrast, the yellow, fe the yellow fever virus has two very clear different epidemiological cycles, one which causes urban yellow fever that uh, is transmitted by the Aedes mosquitoes and the other, again, the sylvatic cycle that includes other mosquitoes as main vectors. It is important to highlight at this point that all these different viruses have primates as their animal reservoirs, as far as we know, except for dengue, which is not very clear what is there in nature. 
The other families we should not leave behind are the Toga Viridi and the Bunia Viridi family. And I would particularly highlight among the Toga Viridi uh, viruses, the alpha virus vi viruses, which include more than 30 different viral, uh, viral uh, specimens. We would, uh, among these, highlight the chikungunya virus that again is uh, transmitted by Aedes mosquitoes, has primates as animal reservoir, and causes in humans a febrile illness with rash and arthropathy. We have the group of encephalitis uh, caused by alpha viruses that include Eastern equine encephalitis, Western equine encephalitis, and the Venezuelan in equine encephalitis. And finally, among the Bunia viruses that uh, can be counted over 200 different viruses, the Oropushi disease virus that causes, again, fever, rash, and arthropathy in South America, and that has birds, primates, and sloths as animal reservoirs, and that has that has a different vector in transmission, which are midges. If we take the three most common arboviral infections in our region, we will stick to dengue, Zika, and chikungunya. And when we compare these three different viral agents, as we have already said, two of them belong to the Flaviviridae family and one to the Toga viridi family in the genus alpha virus, which is chikungunya. They are all single-stranded RNA viruses. And one particular distinction that should be made is that we have four different serotypes for dengue virus. And in contrast, we have only one serotype for both Zika and chikungunya. Uh, their viral particles are shown in electron microscopy here at the bottom. And you also see they are, that they are similar in size. And the Flaviviridae viruses share proteins that have uh, similarity, molecular similarities leading to a possible cross-seroreactivity. Cross -sero and this does not happen among uh, between chikungunya and the other flavivirus agents. In terms of transmission, we have evidence that all three are transmitted by mosquito vectors of the Aedes genus, which could be Aedes aegypti or Aedes albopictus. We have evidence of mother to child transmission for the three of them, even those the rate in which this occurs may vary. We have no evidence of breastfeeding transmission. We have some evidence of bloodborne infections that are transfusion associated. And we have, as you all know, uh, very robust evidence of the sexual transmission of Zika virus, but not of the other two. Now let's go back in history to say how these things have been evolving in Brazil since the 19th century. At that time, Rio de Janeiro was the national capital. And in the late 1800s and early 1900s, we were facing an important public health crisis. Just for you to have an idea, at that time in Brazil, Tuberculosis was the main cause of death. And we had experienced a very severe yellow fever outbreak in a couple of years in the late 19th century and a particular outbreak in 1850, which led to over 4,000 deaths. At that time, public health measures were put in place in order to sanitize Rio de Janeiro. And at that time, the belief was that those people who of lower socioeconomic status, many of them who were former African slaves living in very poor housing conditions in houses that were called in Portuguese cortiços, were the main problem. 
And those cortices were thought to be uh, the main foci of transmission. So a number of sanitizing measures were put in place following measures that had already been put in place in Paris uh, uh, some decades before, putting down those houses that had been built in poor conditions, opening wide avenues with the idea that making air circulate would be better to control the transmission of that agent, which was not known, of course, to be a virus. Other measures that were put in place included quarantine, ship disinfection, and a number of environmental interventions that had a very sharp social impact because these populations were simply expelled from the neighborhoods where they lived and they had to move to, the, to other areas of the city which were uphill and at that time uh, they started building their shacks in those areas which were uh, the, let's say, the, which was the cradle of the so-called slums, favelas, which are still there uh, in the 21st century. So this was the result of, of expelling those populations from the place where they lived in the central area of the city and simply letting them on their own to find a place to live. It is also important to say that yellow fever was the very first disease in Brazil that required mandatory notification. And a famous and very important public health officer at that time was Oswaldo Cruz, that later named the foundation uh, that was named after him, which is one of the most important biotechnology uh, enterprises and tropical medicine research institutes in Brazil today. Oswaldo Cruz led the operation to control yellow fever in Rio de Janeiro, which was his task. And he in fact succeeded in eliminating the disease from the capital, Brazilian capital in four years. Another outbreak was then uh, going to happen in the 20th century in the 1920s, and the same measures that had been used by Oswaldo Cruz were again repeated in an attempt to control the outbreak in the early 20th century. But at that time, uh, public health officers recognized urban yellow fever was not the only form of the disease, and that there was a sylvatic form which was transmitted in forests and that had different vectors as important players and had primates and non-human primates as animal reservoirs. So this raised a, a very important concern that even though it would be possible to eliminate urban yellow fever if measures were sustained, it would be almost impossible to eliminate the sylvatic form. In fact, this was, was ended up occurring. Urban transmission was eliminated from Brazil in the 1940s after a very strong uh, campaign to eliminate the vector, which was inspired in former malaria campaigns, so that in 1958, the Pan American Health Organization declared Brazil Aedes aegypti free. So the idea was that then we would not have the urban transmission again. However, since the eradication of the sylvatic form is impossible, there is always a remaining threat that urban yellow fever could be reintroduced in case the vector came back. What happened to the vector? Let me tell you in history what happened. On the left side of this slide, we see the distribution of Aedes aegypti in the Americas in the 1900s, at the beginning of the 20th century. As you can see, it was widely spread throughout the American continent, leaving 
the extreme northern and southern part of the continent, it is free. What happened after the intensification of the vector control program was that it was eliminated from the largest area of the continent with only a small piece of South America in the northern part of South America uh, remaining with foci of, of the vector. And what is important to highlight is that it was never eliminated from the Caribbean and from the United States. A paper published in 1963 raised this issue, saying that the elimination of urban yellow fever in the Americas would only be possible if in vector control was intensified, and that for that, uh, there was a need for a strong commitment of the United States. However, uh, this cooperation and effort of the, of the United States was never accomplished. And what happened later on is that by the 1930s, the vector was widespread, it was reduced, and then it came back. As you can see, uh, in the 1970s, we had the vector distribution to limited areas of South America, Southern North America, and the Caribbean Basin. But again, when we move to the 21st century, we see that we have the vector uh, uh, in, in all regions of the continent it used to live in at the very beginning. So this is here we have a very important message. Public health measures, particularly those we are talking about concerning vector control can never be stopped. They have to be sustained. And for that, they have to receive continuous funding throughout the years. Now let's move a little bit now to the clinical manifestations of our bovaral infection. The first important point to raise here is how do we suspect clinically of an arboviral infection uh, of the kind we are discussing right now? We should start thinking about those agents. Whenever we see a patient with an acute febrile illness with rash, jaundice, or bleeding, uh, bearing in mind that the febrile illness it can, is very common and rash and jaundice and bleeding can be there or might be absent. So it's a combination of these symptoms that should be raise the suspicion of an arboviral infection added to the information that the patient was exposed to a risk area. So it's very important for clinicians to know the epidemiological picture, where these diseases are occurring, where the viruses are circulating, so that they can raise their clinical reasoning in suspicion of these conditions. Other common symptoms in this uh, case are conjunctivitis, joint pain or arthritis, muscle pain, and headache. Now let's move to each one of the arboviral infections we are highlighting, starting with dengue. We can suspect of dengue if we have any patient with high fever and any two of the following other symptoms, severe high headache, pain behind the eyes, joint pain, muscle pain, rash, and bleeding. And bleeding can be mild or more intense and can occur in the nose, in the gums, or even in the skin as petechial or ecchymotic hemorrhages. As you see here in the picture, this is the rash that usually occurs in, dengues, uh, in dengue patients. It is a reddish uh, rash. It is also, uh, it is cleared by pressure you can see here with the hands, and it leaves some areas of spared skin amid the affected areas. 
When we move to chikungunya, I should highlight that this viral infection is most often asymptomatic. So clinical disease occurs in a low proportion of cases. The disease onset in these symptomatic patients occurs less than a week before after infection and is mainly uh, shown with the symptoms of fever and joint pain. Of course, headache, muscle pain uh, can also occur, rash. And what is particularly interesting to help us recognize chikungunya is the common occurrence of joint edema. And as you see in the pictures, this edema is not limited to the joints of hands and feet, the ankle, the knees, but also uh, progresses into the peri joint tissue, soft tissue. So it's not just a joint edema, but it's all, it's all, it can also be an edema that affects the surrounding soft tissue. It is important to say that in some, of, in some patients, these symptoms can be really severe and disabling with an important impairment in the quality of life of patients. If we move to Zika infection, now we again have to say that symptomatic infection is rare. It occurs in few patients around 20% only. And the disease onset is very sudden. It occurs few days after the infection, after the mosquito bite, and the main uh, reported symptoms and the most common reported symptoms are rash and conjunctivitis. As you see in the picture, conjunctivitis is a hallmark of Zika infection. Apart from that, of course, muscle pain, joint pain can, can occur, and itching is another common feature that helps, helps us differentiate Zika from chikungunya and dengue. Of course, we can build the table in, in order to say which of these particular symptoms are more common in Zika infection or in dengue infection or even in chikungunya infection. But of course, this will work when we have a large series of patients and then we can really calculate different rates of occurrence of different symptoms. But what I want to tell you is that when we see one patient, one single patient, it's very hard to differentiate these three arboviral infections, particularly when we take into consideration the fact that the three viruses can co-circulate in the same geographic area. So it's very hard to rule out any of these conditions exclusively on clinical grounds. We have to move into diagnosis. Now let's see how the diseases evolve clinically. So starting with dengue, I would say that this early febrile phase can usually lasts for three to six days. And for in the great majority of cases, symptoms will subside after that, except sometimes for a prolonged report of fatigue that can last for several weeks. In contrast to this uh, course that is followed by the vast majority of cases, of cases, there are few patients that do not have clinical resolution after a week, but that rather progress into a more severe form which is called severe dengue. It is very important for clinicians to recognize or try at least to recognize which patients are going to progress to severe disease. And for that, we can rely on the so-called warning signs, clinical and laboratory signs that raise the suspicion and the likelihood of adverse progression. Let me just name some of these warning signs. Low platelet counts, 
or a rapid decline in the number of platelets, persistent abdominal pain or vomiting, an increased hematocrit when uh, we go for a very simple lab assessment, spontaneous mucosal bleeding, the appearance of an enlarged liver and or spleen, or spleen, the occurrence of body effusions and psychiatric or neurologic manifestations such as lethargy or restlessness. So if we have any of these conditions in our patient, uh, alone or in combination, we should be concerned that the patient might evolve to a more severe disease, and we should recommend hospitalization for a closer monitoring and for cautious rehydration. Many of these conditions are consequent to increased vascular permeability, leading to uh, loss of fluids from the intravascular space. And in that situation, risk of progression to shock is considerable, and this will lead to high mortality. So if we, if we cannot eliminate dengue from occurring in high risk areas, we should at least try our best to mitigate disease progression, to be able to recognize patients with dengue, to start rehydrating them by the oral route very soon and to be very keen in observing whether warning signs uh, show up and in case they do recommend hospitalization for a more close care. Severe dengue when it occurs it will be accompanied by spontaneous bleeding by severe thrombocytopenia due to, as I just said, increased vascular permeability. This leads to the occurrence of body effusions in different parts of the body, in the, in the chest or in the abdomen, and to hemoconcentration that can be easily depicted or recognized used with hematocrit counts. As you see in this picture, Signs of bleeding can occur in different uh, sites. So the clinician should be very keen to look for them and recognize them as soon as possible. Now let's move to chikungunya. As I told you, the disease is usually asymptomatic and most often mild. However, the main complication in this case is chronic infection, which will uh, show itself as persistent joint and muscle pain. When we analyze clinical series, for instance, in, in, in the Reunion Island, we are going to outbreak in the early uh, 2000s. We are going to see that in their description, they showed that about 16% of patients had muscle and joint pain that lasted for a month. However, about one third of patients would have prolonged complication that might last for up to three months. And in about half of all cases, this would last even more for over four months, and in 20% of cases, for about a year or more. So this is very concerning, because if the patient has prolonged joint pain and muscle pain, he will not be able to perform his daily routine. And of course, quality of life will be significantly impaired. In the Italian case series, we had even a higher proportion of patients, two thirds of them in fact, who had prolonged joint and muscle pain and fatigue for over a year. And this of course brings an extra burden to health services because these patients will need 
uh, pain relief and will need rehabilitation. And sometimes uh, sites are not prepared to cope with this uh, exceptional burden for rehabilitation services and for uh, specialist care, uh, including rheumatologists. In some areas in, in northern eastern Brazil, for instance, the number of patients who required prolonged specialized care exceeded the number of rheumatologists that were available in those services. An important issue to add is the fact that there, are, that there have been some risk factors that were recognized of uh, increasing the likelihood of chronic chikungunya infection. And these are, for instance, older age or patients who already reported previous joint disease. So it's very important for us to pay sp a special attention in the elderly population and in those who had previous arthropathy when we think about chikungunya. As for Zika, you know that our main concern are complications because the Zika virus fibri febrile illness is usually a very mild disease when clinically apparent or can most often be an asymptomatic viral infection. The problem is that Zika virus is recognizably associated with a congenital syndrome that can have different manifestations, among which microcephaly is the most severe. However, it is important to say that a, a, a small proportion of newborns from mothers with acute Zika viral infections will be born with microcephaly. Other, others, in fact, may be born with milder uh, neurologic abnormalities that will uh, be discovered and identified later in their uh, neur neurocognitive development. And it's important also to say that Zika congenital syndrome is not the only neurological compl complication of the disease because Guillain-Barré syndrome is also an important uh, subsequent event that increases burden to health services because very often it will requ require hospitalization. I brought here some pictures which are very, uh, I would say, impacting because they show uh, the if, how we see these newborns with microcephaly. Uh, and when we do neuroimaging, uh, when we use neuroimaging techniques, we'll recognize that, has that, ha that there has been a severe impairment of brain development. So the long-term, let's say, prognosis of these severely affected children is very limited. Now, having had this clinical overview, now let's move into public health actions. What has raised recent interest uh, in regard to arboviral infections is exactly the increase in their incidence and in their geographical spread and the exceptional disease burden they are bringing about to health services in the affected areas. If we think about increase in incidence of an infectious disease and increase in the geographical distribution of that disease, we will certainly come to the concept of an emerging or a re-emerging infection. So the actual interest concerning arboviral infections is the fact that they are important emerging infections or re-emerging infections in some areas of the globe. One should then raise the point, what, had, what has happened that led to this emerging 
uh, infections or to the um, re-emergence of these infections in areas that had been previously affected. And of course, there is a long list of associated factors. It is true that we have, we are more competent in terms of testing now. So we really diagnose a larger proportion of cases that in previous times would lie uh, without a definition of clear diagnosis. Uh, we know there is, a, the con this can also be a consequence of climate change in terms of vector distribution. This can be a consequence of environmental damage due to unorganized urbanization process uh, that leads to poor housing, shortage of water supplies, of waste disposal management. And of course, this has a lot to do with our behavior. Humans uh, sometimes behave as if they don't want to help control these issues due to the vulnerability, the social vulnerability they are involved with. Human migration is also an issue. And of course, commerce and international travel has raised the possibility of these emerging and re-emerging infections be spread to areas where we have a, a proper ecological system to allow transmission. So if we have an area that is free from an ibroviral infection currently, but that has the vector, as soon as infected humans travel to that particular destination, the situation is there for circu viral circulation to start. For you to have an idea, these are important maps that show the distribution of Aedes mosquitoes. Uh, on the top, we see the distribution of Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, and at the bottom, Aedes albopictus mosquitoes. And you can see that the main difference here is that Aedes albopictus is present in Southern Europe, in the Mediterranean area, and also in larger proportion in the, in the Southern United States. So this brings the risk, the actual risk of introduction or reintroduction of arboviral diseases in those particular areas. We should then say that currently more than 3 billion people, 3 billion people live in Eddie's infested region and therefore are at risk. However, it is true that the global burden of these diseases is yet limited to some areas. So here we see the high burden, high risk areas for dengue transmission as depicted in 2014 by the WHO, which concentrates this in the uh, trop tropical areas, as you see, and subtropical areas. A similar picture is, can be seen and recognized when we see the, the distribution of chikungunya virus, uh, with the exception that the United States and Western Europe uh, are also included in this case, and some countries in Southern South America as well. And what we, we learned from the Global Burden of Disease Study that was published in 2017, is that the number of deaths due to dengue and the number of deaths of disability adjusted life years that are lost as a consequence of dengue are increasing in, in the past uh, decades. So we are currently living a threat, a global health threat in terms of dengue uh, with a clear increase in mortality and in impairment of quality of life of populations that live in those areas. 
The disease burden for dengue can be estimated as affecting more than half of the global population because they live in risk areas. The WHO estimates that about 40, 400, 400 million cases of dengue occur every year, but about one fourth of them are not are symptomatic. Three fourths of them are not re clinically recognized. We have recently had uh, seen a trend in, in uh, uh, an increasing trend in the number of severe cases, leading to increased need of hospitalization and increased mortality. So this is a matter of concern. And of course, if we take everything into, into account, we will come up with an important consequence that is uh, the relevant economic impact of dengue uh, across the globe. According to the 2017 Global Burden of Disease Study, uh, we had that year over 40,000 uh, deaths, uh, dengue associated deaths, uh, with a 2.9 million deaths, which uh, clearly highlights the important disease burden of, of this arboviral infection. When we move to chikungunya, however, we are not so certain about the figures. They were not reported in the 2017 GBD study. There are studies, however, in the America that try to illustrate that we had about 40 million cases in the Americas alone in 2016 that led to 24 million deaths. Uh, however, we don't have a clear picture how this is translate in a global perspective. In the 2014 outbreak, there is an estimate that we had about 38 million cases of chronic arthritis. And from here, we can understand the exceptional burden to health systems that comes up after a uh, chikungunya outbreak. It is in, associated with impaired quality of life. And of course, this chronic disability will also be associated with important mental health issues. And therefore, an attention should be put uh, in regard to chikungunya control. Finally, when we move to Zika, we should start by saying that this virus was originally identified in Central Africa in the 1950s, but for many, many decades, it was not reported in other areas. So it apparently was restrained to limited locations in that continent. After the 1970s though, uh, references to the occurrence of Zika came out in other continents. And finally, it is very important to highlight uh, the important outbreak we had in Micronesia, more specifically on Yap Island in 2007. From that uh, uh, occurrence, the virus was very clearly recognized and molecularly identified. And from there, we could follow its spread in, southern, in the Southern Pacific region in the beginning of the 21st century. And finally, its introduction in the Americas uh, in the, by 2013 and 14 when it came to Eastern Island, which is part of the Chilean uh, territory. From there, it was uh, now introduced in, uh, and disseminated to other countries in uh, the Americas. As we see from WHO data shown in, in this chart, we see here in uh, blue, in light blue, that the Americas have been since nine, uh, 2015 the most hard, hard, the most importantly affected continent or 
WHO region uh, concerning Zika virus infection. However, the disease is also most often asymptomatic or mild, as I have already pointed out. So our main concern is related to its complications, Zika virus congenital syndrome and Guillain-Barré syndrome, with the number of dis neurologic disturbances that follow each one of those conditions, microcephaly, ocular disturbances, hearing loss, impaired neurocognitive development for Zika congenital syndrome, and of course, the need for hospitalization and, uh, and, and very frequently, the need for mechanical ventilation for patients with Guillain-Barré syndrome. An import, another important aspect of Zika virus is its, the possibility of its sexual transmission. So this brings about important concerns and effects cons, uh, related to sexual and reproductive rights of people living in affected areas. And there has re been a recently description of a clinical impact on male fertility after a Zika virus uh, febrile illness due to the involvement of testes. In the GBD 2017 study, uh, there was an estimate of about 2,200 deaths uh, lost in, uh, as a consequence of Zika virus infection. So as you see here, if I can summarize, the burden of disease is relevant for the three of them, of course, with peculiar aspect, as aspects for each one of them. Dengue in Latin America has been evolving in different patterns. So as you see in this picture, uh, in different years of the 21st century, different areas of, the, of Latin America and the Caribbean region were, were more dramatically affected. And this has to do with the circulation of different viral serotypes and with herd immunity in the populations that live in those areas. But we can see that it has been very consistent. We have been having dengue circulation throughout across the region throughout the years since uh, the early 2000s. And the impact in terms of mortality uh, due to dengue in different continents may vary from one year to the other, depending on the var viral serotype, on the intensity of the out severity of the outbreak, and also related to the fact that this, if the outbreak is affecting previously exposed uh, uh, patients who can have a secondary infection that can be more severe than primary infection or not. In Brazil, in the past few years, we have been hardly hit, hard, hardly hit by dengue. As you see, in, in 2015 and 2016, this is a picture that shows the number of reported cases per week per epidemiological week throughout the year. And as you can see here, the, in the years 2015 and 16, we had an, several weeks in the year when we had over 100,000 new cases being reported in the country. That's a very hard epidemic. In the years 2017 and 18, in contrast, we had a sharp decrease in the number of cases. And as you can see here, we are talking now not more about 100,000 cases per week, but about 10,000 cases or 12,000 cases per week or even less. And finally, in 2019, we again had an important increase that led to us being able to recognize the same figures as in the early years I described, 
in, uh, in 2019, many weeks when we had over 100,000 new, new cases being reported per week. So as you see, this will vary from uh, a long time, depending on herd immunity, on the sero viral serotype and other epidemiological conditions. When we talk about chikungunya in Brazil, you also see here that we had very important outbreaks in 2016 and 2017 with a decrease in, case, in number of cases in 2018. But just as a matter of comparison, see that we are talking here about 10 to 12,000 cases a week and not 100,000 of cases a week as we have seen for dengue. And in, in the years 2007, in the year 2017, we again had an important outbreak with a decrease again in 2018. And finally, again, a new important outbreak in 2019. So as you see, conditions change along the years, and this will lead to a more important outbreak or a less relevant outbreak in one particular uh, point in time. But the fact I would like to highlight is that we have had, be, we have been having a sustained circulation of the virus throughout the years. For Zika virus, this is not the case. We, as I said, we had the very important outbreak in 2016, when in the peak of the season, of the outbreak season, we had some weeks in which we reported over 15 or 16,000 cases, but this went down very sharply uh, in the same year and never came back in 2017 or 18. We never had more than 300 cases being reported every year, every week, sorry. And finally, as we move to 2019 and 2020, we are, again are seeing this limited number of cases. So it's, it's a fact that we have sustained transmission, but we, we so far have not repeated the 2016 epidemic of Zika we saw at first. In the different Latin America and Caribbean areas, we see different levels of involvement. And of course, the Southern Cone and the Andean subregions have been the most importantly affected areas as compared to the Caribbean and Central America and uh, uh, these parts of the Latin America and Caribbean area. One final uh, point about Zika infection is that even though uh, the description of cases was, more, was very important in 2015 and 2016 in particular, we now know using genetic findings, using genome sequencing, that the virus was already circulating in the Americas a couple of years before, starting from 2012. So we now have, I wanted to make this point, we now have important molecular tools that can help us uh, be better in our performance in terms of viral surveillance for uh, uh, emerging infection. So if we really are, if we were really capable of setting up a lab network using those novel uh, viral genome sequencing techniques, uh, we would be able to uh, create an important network uh, involving different countries in the Americas or even in other continents to be capable, to be able to detect very early introduction of novel emerging agents. The spread in the Americas was very fast after its introduction in Brazil. And by 2017, it was already there, spread to all countries in the Americas, except for Chile, Uruguay, and Canada. Uh, 
Chile and Canada are, are better understood because of their weather conditions and the fact that we have an important mountain barrier here between Argentina and Chile, but we never understood very well why Uruguay was not as affected, was not so affected as its neighboring countries. Now let's move to our final topic, arboviral, control, arboviral infection control and prevention. Unfortunately, so far, we have no effective antiviral drugs to be used in these conditions. And we also do not have vaccines for chikungunya and Zika. You all know that we have a number of vaccines in the pipeline, uh, some of them in the final phases of clinical trials, and we are looking forward to uh, receiving these results and finally uh, defining whether we will have a good vaccine candidate that could be used in public health to help control the spread of chikungunya and Zika. This, of course, would really be very important. As for dengue, we do have a licensed vaccine. This is the Deng Vaxia vaccine, uh, manufactured by Sanofi Pasteur. It is a tetravalent recombinant vaccine. This is important to highlight. It induces protection against the four different dengue virus genotypes, and it is currently recommended for residents in endemic areas that are aged between 9 and 45. However, it is important to point out that the efficacy rates vary a lot, and that variation is related to the serotype, viral serotype we are talking about. So uh, induction of protection is better for some serotypes as compared to others. And it's also related to the age of the vaccinee. So uh, we have not seen a very consistent efficacy result throughout the, across the age groups. And one particular uh, matter of concern is the fact that we have now clearly recognized that this vaccine cannot be used in dengue naive individuals, in people who have never been infected by the dengue virus. And why is that so? It was recognized that if we vaccinate uh, dengue naive individuals with dengue vaccine, they, this vaccine will elicit an immune response, will lead to the production of antibodies, specific antibodies, but these antibodies, in case of a, a real dengue uh, wild virus infection, will lead to more severe disease. And this is very concordant to our previous knowledge that secondary infection could even uh, worse the clinical manifestations and the severity of dengue uh, when we were talking about subsequent uh, wild type virus infections. So this was again shown by the vaccine, and this is a major uh, drawback concerning uh, this particular vaccine. Uh, it, if it cannot be used in dengue naive people, we have to have these people undergo zero screening before they are vaccinated. And this, of course, limits its use in public health, in its wide use in public health due to additional costs. If we don't have drugs and vaccines, control will be limited to reducing exposure to the vector by using of window nets, by using of bed nets, by using of repellents, and of course, uh, by vector control. 
And vector control is a very troublesome and time-consuming initiative. It requires frequent home visits for the detection of vector larvae to, uh, for the use of larv larvae sites and elimination of all breeding sites. And by seeing this picture, you can easily recognize how, realize how difficult this is because human, in the human environment, we have artificially created many, many vector breeding sites. So we are actually contributing to the proliferation of those mosquitoes. To, co to eliminate this possibility, or at least to mitigate this effect, we will need a very committed population, a, a community. So health education will play and plays a pivotal role in this initiative. We have to educate people how to manage waste, how to store water uh, properly to avoid the creation of new breeding, mosquito breeding sites. It's very hard to educate people, as you all know. So a special effort is being put in school children trying to educate the next generation to uh, adopt healthier habits and adopt health, uh, healthier lives in terms of environmental health. I should not end this talk without mentioning the fact that many researchers uh, around the, the globe are working with an alternative for vector control that is the use of genetically modified mosquitoes. Mosquitoes that by, uh, as a consequence of genetical modification will not be able uh, to transmit the infection. However, uh, the results that have been obtained so far are not very promising. So I would not put a lot of emphasis in this particular initiative at this point, because it would be very, end up being very disappointing. Another important aspect is that it is very hard to achieve an effective vector control if we don't have other uh, circumstances, uh, other conditions to support vector control. It's very hard to have effective vector control in the absence of adequate sanitation, in the absence of access to piped water, in the absence of an appropriate solid waste disposal, without community participation and without any, the building of a network of intersectoral collaboration. This is not something that health officers, public health officers can do on their own. We are talking about water supplies, about sanitation, about housing conditions, about the need to educate people. So this goes across the board. We need to have all these sectors being put into collaboration, bring them on board for a more effective result. As you all know, the United Nations 2030 agenda uh, that was summarized as sustainable development goals has a goal number three, which is very ambitious. And that reads, we should ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. And its target 3.3, is that by 2030, we should end the epidemics of all these diseases and other communicable diseases. And here, of course, our bovaral infections are included. So we have committed, our nations have committed themselves to end the epidemics of our bovaral infections by 2030. But 2030 is not far ahead, it's just around the corner. So we should really engage in more coordinated 
action and more effective initiatives to really, if we really want to meet this particular goal. What do we need for that? We need funding. We need political will of, of, of our governmental rulers. We need an appropriate planning and implementation of public policies. We need health service integration and advocacy for these initiatives. And uh, above all, we'll we will need to have all these initiatives being worked with under the framework of human rights, protecting and promoting human rights of the populations that are in the risk areas of the globe. This is uh, our final goal for 2030, but the context is not very promising. Particularly in Brazil, our socioeconomic context is of economic recession and of increased social inequality, as seen here by the Gini coefficient. So after a few years of reducing, of being able to reduce social inequalities, we are now again in the last few years increasing social inequality, probably as a consequence of economic recession. And here I have some figures that didn't come up, come to the time of the COVID-19 epidemic. And as we all know, COVID-19 epidemic will lay an extra burden, an extra economic burden, an extra social burden, and an extra burden to health systems that will impair even more the possibility of these economies uh, really cleaning up uh, the cleaning up uh, all the mess that was brought as a consequence of long economic recession followed by a pandemic. So we should, to a certain point, be very concerned of how capable we will be of really achieving the 2030 goals we set uh, for ourselves. We are living uh, with real and actual and important challenges and threats to public health due to economic recession, increase in unemployment rates, increased social inequality, uh, austerity measures. Governments now are reducing budgets, are being less committed with social policies, and this can end up in a tragedy in terms of control of infectious diseases. So I really hope we find the ways to reverse this trend and try to start building up a better route towards a situation that would make us uh, free from the threats of arboviral infections and from the burden these infections bring to our health systems. I would uh, like to finalize by thanking a number of colleagues who have, have helped me put together this presentation. Professors Marcia Castro, Adriano Massuda, Professor Expedito Luna, and Professor Vivian Avelino Silva, and all my colleagues at the University of Sao Paulo. And I uh, would like to repeat, I'm really happy to be part of this course. Thank you very much for the opportunity.